Chapter One of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nan Dodge. Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. Chapter One A Letter from Grandpa. Bunny, Bunny Brown, where are you? Bunny's mother stood on the front porch, looking first in the yard, then up and down the street in front of the house, but she did not see her little boy. "'Sue! Sue, dear, where are you, and where is Bunny?' Again Mrs. Brown called. This time she had an answer. "'Here I am, mother, on the side porch.' A little girl with brown eyes came around the corner of the house. By one arm she carried a doll, and the doll was leaking sawdust on the porch. Mrs. Brown smiled when she saw this. "'Why, Sue, my dear!' she exclaimed. "'What is the matter with your doll? She is bleeding sawdust, as you used to call it.' "'Oh, well, mother, this is just my old doll,' Sue answered. "'It's the one I let Bunny take to play Punch and Judy show with, and he hit her with a stick and made her sawdust come out. Did you want me, mother?' "'Yes, Sue, and I want Bunny, too. Where is he?' "'He was here a little while ago,' the brown-eyed girl answered. "'But, oh, mother, you're all dressed up. Where are you going? Can't I go with you?' "'Yes, that is what I called you for, and I want Bunny, too. Have you seen him?' "'No, mother, but I shall go in and wash my face, if I'm going with you. Where are we going?' "'Just down to the store, and then I'm going to stop in the post office and see if there are any letters for us. Yes, run in and wash your face and hands.' Your dress is clean enough. I'll look for Bunny. Mrs. Brown walked out to the front gate and again called, Bunny, Bunny Brown, where are you? No one answered, but a nice old man, limping a little and leaning on a stick, came around from the back yard. He looked like a soldier, and he had been in the war many years ago. Oh, Uncle Tad, Mrs. Brown asked, have you seen Bunny? The nice old man laughed. "'Yes, I've seen him,' he replied. "'He went off down the street in his express wagon. "'That dog, Splash, was pulling him.' "'I hope he hasn't gone too far,' observed Mrs. Brown. "'When Bunny gets to riding with his dog, "'he doesn't think how far away he goes.' "'I'll see if I can find him for you,' offered Uncle Tad with another laugh. "'That Bunny Brown is surely a great boy,' he murmured, "'as he limped off down the street. "'He did not have far to go.' nor did Mrs. Brown have long to wait, for, in about a minute, a barking was heard. Then came a rattle of wheels on the sidewalk, and a boy's voice called out, "'Get up, Splash! Get up! Go fast now! Go as fast as you can! Hurrah! That's the way to do it!' Up dashed a small express wagon, drawn by a big, fine, shaggy dog, that seemed to be having almost as much fun as was the blue-eyed, curly-haired boy who rode in the cart. "'Oh, Bunny, Bunny, don't go so fast,' cried his mother. "'You'll spill out and hurt yourself. Don't go so fast.' "'Have to go fast, mother,' said Bunny Brown. "'We have to go fast, don't we, Splash?' The dog barked, but he slowed up, for Uncle Tad held out his hand to pat the big fellow, and Splash dearly loved Uncle Tad. "'We're a fire engine, and we're going to a fire,' Bunny Brown explained. "'Fire engines always have to go fast, don't they, Splash?' old miss hollyhock's house is on fire and we're going to put it out only make-believe of course cried bunny quickly for he saw that his mother looked a bit frightened when she heard him speak of a fire we're just pretending there's a blaze here we go got to put out the fire see i've got a can of water all ready for it bunny turned to show his mother and uncle tad where in the back of his express wagon he had set the garden sprinkling can full of water. Just as Bunny did that, Splash, his big dog, started to run. Bunny fell over backward off the seat. Out fell the sprinkling can full of water, splashing all over Uncle Tad's feet. Then Bunny himself fell out of the wagon, but he landed on some soft grass at the edge of the sidewalk, so he was not in the least hurt. Splash ran on a little way, pulling the empty wagon, but Bunny, jumping to his feet, called out, "'Whoa, Splash!' and the dog stopped. For a few seconds they all stood there, 
Uncle Tad looking down at his wet feet, Bunny looking rather surprised at having fallen over backward, and Mrs. Brown hardly knowing whether to laugh or scold. As for Splash, he just stood still, his long red tongue hanging out of his mouth, while his breath came fast. For it was a hot day, and he had been running with Bunny. "'Oh, dear, Bunny,' said Mrs. Brown at last, "'see what you've done. You've made Uncle Tad all wet.' "'I didn't do it, Mother. It was Splash,' said the little boy. "'He started before I was ready. I—I'm sorry, Uncle Tad. Will it hurt your rheumatism?' "'No, I guess not, Bunny boy. It's a hot day, and a little water won't do me any harm. But it's all spilled now, and how are you going to put out the fire?' "'Oh, I guess we'll make believe the fire's out,' said Bunny. I was going to stop playing anyhow. "'Where are you going, Mother?' he asked for he saw that his mother was dressed as she usually was when she went downtown. "'I am going to the store,' she said, and I was looking for you and Sue to go with me. Sue is getting washed. "'If that water had splashed on Bunny instead of on me, he would have been washed too,' said Uncle Tad with a laugh. "'Oh, mother, I'll go and wash myself right away,' Bunny cried. Going downtown with their mother was a treat that he and Sue liked very much." "'May Splash come, too?' Bunny asked. "'Not this time, dear. Now hurry. I'll wait for you on the porch.' "'And I guess I'd better go and put on dry shoes,' said Uncle Tad. "'I didn't know I was going to be the make-believe fire and get put out, Bunny.' Bunny laughed. Then he drove Splash into the yard, put away the sprinkling can, unhitched the dog from the express wagon, and put the wagon in the barn where it was kept.' Splash went off by himself to lie down and rest in the shade, while Bunny hurried into the house to wash his hands and face. Soon he and Sue were walking down the village street with their mother. As the children passed a little toy and candy shop, kept by Mrs. Redden, Bunny looked in the window and said, "'Oh, mother, she's got a new kind of candy in there.' "'So she has,' cried Sue, pressing her little nose flat against the glass." Mrs. Brown smiled. "'Perhaps we may stop and get some on our way back,' she said. "'We haven't time for candy now. I want to see if we have any letters in the post office.' A little later they passed a house, in the side yard of which was a lady, weeding the flower garden. "'Good morning, Miss Winkler,' called Mrs. Brown. "'Oh, good morning,' was the answer. "'Won't you come in?' "'No, thank you. We haven't time now.' "'Oh, mother, do go in,' begged Bunny. "'Sue and I want to see Wango.' "'Wango was a little pet monkey, "'which Mr. Winkler, an old sailor, "'had brought home with him from one of his many ocean voyages. "'The monkey did a number of tricks, "'and Bunny and Sue liked him very much "'and often petted him. "'No, dears, we can't stop to see Wango now. "'Some other time,' Mrs. Brown said. "'And so she and the children went on to the stores.' When they reached the post office, Mrs. Brown found three letters in her box. She opened one and read it. She called to Bunny and Sue. Oh, my dears, I have good news for you. Here is a letter from Grandpa Brown, who lives away out in the country on a farm. He wants us to come and stay all summer with him. Oh, goody, cried Sue, clapping her fat little hands. May we go, Mother? asked Bunny. Oh, let's go to Grandpa's farm. "'Perhaps we may go,' said Mrs. Brown. "'We'll keep right on down to Papa's office now and ask him.'" End of chapter 1「Chapter 2 of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Runaway Monkey Mr. Brown, who was the father of Bunny Brown and his sister Sue, was in the boat business in the seaside village of Belmere. Mr. Brown rented fishing, sailing, and motor boats to those who wanted them, and he had his office on the dock, which was built out into Sandport Bay. "'Oh, mother, do you think Daddy will let us go to Grandpa's farm?' asked Bunny, as he and his sister Sue walked along the street on their way to their father's office, after having gotten the letter from Grandpa Brown." "'Please ask him to let us go,' begged Sue. "'Yes, I think he will,' said Mrs. Brown. The children clapped their hands in joy. 
Once, some years before, they had gone to their grandfather's farm in the country, and they remembered what fun they had had. Now they were older, and they were sure they would have many more good times. "'Well, well,' cried Daddy Brown, as he saw his wife and the two children come into his office on the dock. "'What brings you all down here? Do you want some fish? Or is Bunny looking for another big lobster claw, so he can put it on his nose and play Mr. Punch?' "'No, I don't want any lobster claws now, Papa,' Bunny said. "'But can we go to Grandpa's farm in the country?' Mr. Brown looked at his wife. "'What has happened now?' he asked. He was almost sure that something had happened, because Bunny and Sue looked so excited. "'Oh!' cried the little girl. "'Bunny went to a fire, and he was upset, and Splash spilled the water all over Uncle Tad, and we got a letter, and—' Sue had to stop. She had talked so fast she was all out of breath. Mr. Brown laughed. "'What is it all about?' he asked his wife. Mrs. Brown told him how Bunny had been playing fire engine in his express wagon, with the dog and about the upset, when the water was spilled on Uncle Tad. "'But what we came to see you about, Daddy,' she went on, "'is this letter from Father.' Grandpa Brown was Mr. Brown's father, you see, and Mr. Brown and his wife— always spoke of the children's grandpa as father. "'Father wants us to bring the children and spend the summer on the farm,' went on Mrs. Brown. "'I think it would be nice if we could go.' "'Oh, let us, Daddy,' cried Bunny and Sue. Mr. Brown looked thoughtful. "'Well,' he said slowly, "'I suppose we could go. I could have the business here looked after all right, and I guess I need a little rest myself.' "'Yes, I think we'll go,' he said. It will take me about a week to get ready. You may write to Father that will come, he said to Mrs. Brown. Was there anything else in his letter? Well, yes. And Mrs. Brown spoke slowly. It's some bad news. Bad news, Bunny interrupted. Can't we go to the farm? It isn't that, Mrs. Brown said quickly. It's about Grandpa's horses. It seems, she said to her husband, while Bunny and Sue listened with all their might, that there was some gypsies camping near the farm. "'Did the gypsies, did they take Grandpa away?' asked Sue, for she had often heard of gypsies taking persons off with them, but really this hardly ever happens. "'No, dear, the gypsies didn't take Grandpa, but they took his best team of horses,' answered her mother. "'That's what he says in his letter. Some of the gypsies' horses were taken sick, and they could not pull the gypsy wagons when they wanted to move their camp.' Some of the gypsy men borrowed Grandpa's team and said they would pay him for the use of it a little while until they could pull their wagons to a new place. And did Father let them take his horses? asked Daddy Brown. Yes. He says in his letter that he wishes now he had not, for, though the gypsies promised to bring the horses back, they did not do so. Oh, did the gypsies keep Grandpa's horses? asked Bunny. Yes, that's what he says. "'Then we can't go to the farm.' And Bunny looked very sorry. "'Why can't we go? What have the horses to do with it?' asked Bunny's mother. "'Because if he hasn't any horses, Grandpa can't come to the station for us and drive us out to the farm.' "'Oh, well, I guess he has more than one team, though he says it was his best one the gypsies borrowed and did not bring back,' said Mrs. Brown to her husband. "'It will be quite a loss to father.' and he was so proud of that team of horses. Yes, answered Mr. Brown, it's too bad. Oh, dear, sighed Sue, Aunt Lou lost her diamond ring, and now Grandpa has lost his horses. But maybe you can find them, Bunny, just as you found Aunt Lou's diamond ring. Ha! Huh, Aunt Lou's ring was in my lobster claw. How could a team of horses get in a lobster claw? asked Bunny with a laugh. Oh, I don't mean that, said Sue. "'but maybe you could find the horses in the woods, "'same as you found the ring in the claw.' "'Maybe,' agreed Bunny. "'But when can we go to the farm?' "'Next week, perhaps,' answered his mother. "'It depends on your father.' "'Yes, we can go next week,' Mr. Brown said. "'Even if Grandpa Brown doesn't get his horses back from the gypsies?' asked Bunny. "'Yes, I think we can manage to reach the farm without Grandpa's horses.' I have a new plan for going out there, something we have never done before. And Daddy Brown nodded at his wife and smiled. Oh, what is it? Bunny asked eagerly. 
"'It's a secret,' said his father. "'I'll tell you after a while.' The children begged and teased to know what it was, but Mr. Brown only laughed and said they would have to wait. Then Mrs. Brown took Bunny and Sue home, and on the way the brother and sister talked of nothing but what fun they would have on Grandpa's farm, and of how sorry they were about the gypsies having borrowed the horses, and keeping them instead of bringing them back, as they should have done. "'But maybe you'll find them,' said Sue. "'I hope so, anyhow. I'll help you look, Bunny.' "'I hope so, too,' replied Bunny. "'We did find Aunt Lou's diamond ring when she thought she never would. "'I will tell you a little about that, though if you like, "'you may read of it in the first volume of this series, "'which is named Bunny Brown and his sister Sue. "'In that I told how the Brown family lived in the seaside town of Belmere "'on Sandport Bay. "'Bunny, who was six years old, and Sue, who was five, were great chums and playmates. They were together nearly all the while and often got into trouble, though of course they had fun and good times also. Their Aunt Lou came to visit them from New York, and the first night she was at the Brown house she lost her diamond ring, when she was helping Mrs. Brown make a salad from a big lobster that was brought ashore in one of Mr. Brown's boats. A lobster is a sort of fish, only it has legs and claws to pinch with. Aunt Lou felt sorry about losing her ring, and Bunny and Sue promised to help her find it. They looked, but for a long time could not discover it. Finally, Bunny found it in the queerest way. Besides finding Aunt Lou's diamond ring, Bunny Brown and his sister Sue did many other things, which are told of in the first book. They had good fun with their friends Charlie Starr, Harry Bentley, Mary and George Watson, and Sadie West and Helen Newton, children of about their own age. Bunny and Sue got locked in an empty house, and thought they would have to stay there all night, but they did not. They went on a trolley ride and got lost, and wandered into a moving picture show, and up on the stage where they made everybody laugh. Bunny Brown was always thinking of new things to do, and Sue was always ready to help him do them. The children were not naughty. But they did get into trouble, and out again, more easily than any tots of whom I ever heard. They had many friends, and everybody in town knew and liked them. And now we're going to have more good fun, said Bunny, on the afternoon of the day when Grandpa Brown's letter came. Oh, I just love it on the farm. We can play in the hay, and go after the cows, and hunt eggs, said Sue. "'But you mustn't fall into any hen's nest as you did once in our barn "'and get your dress all egg,' said Bunny. "'I won't,' promised Sue. "'Oh, Bunny, I can hardly wait.' "'And she jumped up and down. She was so excited and happy. "'Neither can I,' said her brother. "'I'll tell you what let's do.' "'What?' asked Sue. "'Let's go down to Mrs. Redden's and get a lollipop. "'We have our penny, and Mother said we could each spend one this afternoon.' "'All right,' Sue replied. "'And then shall we go in and see Wango the monkey?' "'I guess so, but we'd better eat our lollipops first, "'or he'll beg them away from us.' "'Wango was very fond of candy, "'and if the children stood in front of him eating any, "'he would beg so hard for some "'and hold out his little paws in such a sad way "'that they could not help sharing their treat with him. "'Wango was sometimes kept in a big cage.' but he was also often allowed to be outside on the porch with a chain fastened to his collar and then snapped to a ring in the porch post. Bunny Brown and his sister Sue bought their lollipops at Mrs. Redden's store and then went on to Mr. Winkler's house to see the monkey. Mr. Winkler, the old sailor, lived with his sister, Miss Winkler. The sister did not like her brother's monkey very much. "'Shall we tell Miss Winkler about going to Grandpa's farm?' asked Sue, as she and Bunny walked along the street, hand in hand, eating their candy. "'Yes, and we'll tell her about the gypsies taking Grandpa's horses. Maybe she might see them and tell the bad men to give them back.' "'Maybe,' agreed Sue. "'Is your lollipop good, Bunny?' "'Awful good. Is yours?' "'Yep.' The two children walked on and soon were within sight of Miss Winkler's house. "'There's Wango tied on the porch,' cried Bunny. "'I see him,' answered Sue. 
And, oh, Bunny, listen, I hear music. Oh, it's a hand organ, Bunny exclaimed. Oh, see, he has a monkey, Sue cried, pointing to a little furry creature on top of the music box. Wango saw the strange monkey at the same time. Wango jumped up and ran toward the organ grinder as far as the chain would let him. Then Mr. Winkler's monkey chattered and screamed loudly. All at once the Italian stopped playing, for his own monkey suddenly jumped down to the sidewalk, gave a hard pull on the string that was about his neck, broke loose and ran away, far off down the street, while Wango chattered louder than ever. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. The Big Automobile. Bunny, Bunny, look, look! The hand organ man's monkey has run away, cried Sue. Yes, answered Bunny, let's run after him. Maybe we can catch him, and the man will let us play the organ. That was all Bunny Brown and his sister Sue thought about, doing whatever they happened to think of first, and this time it was racing after the runaway monkey. For the hand organ man's monkey was really running away. He was frightened at Wango, I think, for Wango was larger than he, though Wango was quite gentle, even if he did make lots of trouble, such as upsetting the jars in Mrs. Redden's candy store. "'Here, come back, come back!' cried the Italian to his monkey, speaking in what sounded to Bunny and Sue very queer talk. But then the Italian could speak his own language well, even if he could not talk the kind Bunny and Sue used. "'We'll get your monkey for you, Mr. Organ Man,' cried Bunny. "'Come on, Sue.' "'Well, don't run so fast. I can't keep up to you,' called the little girl. "'Wait for me, Bunny.' Bunny turned and clasped Sue's hand in his own. He did not want to leave his little sister behind. Each child still held a half-eaten lollipop. The hand-organ man set down his music box, and he too raced down the street after his runaway monkey. Of course the man could run faster than could Bunny and Sue. All this while Wango was jumping about on the porch, chattering and squealing. He tried to break the chain that was fast to the collar around his neck but it was too strong for his efforts. Once, after Mr. Winkler had fastened his pet out of doors, Wango broke away and hid in Mrs. Redden's candy shop. And oh, how he did smash the candy jars! And what a lot of lollipops he took! But his master, Mr. Winkler, the old sailor, paid for them, so it was all right. Then Mr. Winkler put a stronger chain on Wango, and that is why the pet monkey could not now get away. But he tried very hard, for he wanted to run away also, I think, and have a good time with his friend the hand-organ monkey. Only the hand-organ monkey seemed to be afraid of Wango. But he needn't to be, Bunny said, as he trotted on with Sue, for Wango wouldn't hurt him. Of course not, said Sue. Any more than our dog Splash would have hurt the little yellow dog he ran after one day. I have told you about that in the first book, how Splash ran away with Bunny and Sue, hurrying down the street to make friends with a little yellow dog that once had had a tin can tied to his tail. And also in the first book, I told you how Bunny and Sue got their dog Splash. Bunny and Sue were carried away in a boat and landed on an island in the river. There Sue fell in, and the big dog pulled her out. As no one came for the dog, the Browns kept him. And Bunny and Sue named him Splash, because, as Sue said, he splashed into the water to pull me out. On ran the hand-organ man after his monkey, and on ran Bunny Brown and his sister Sue after the hand-organ man. But Wango had to stay behind. He made so much noise, though, with his chattering and screaming, to say nothing of rattling the chain, that Miss Winkler came running out. She was making a cake, and her hands were all covered with flour, while there was a white spot on the end of her nose. "'Oh, what is the matter? What is the matter?' she cried. "'The hand-organ man's monkey ran away because Wango scared him,' said Bunny. 
and we are running after him. After Wango? Miss Winkler wanted to know. No, after the hand organ monkey, answered Bunny. Come on, Sue. They turned the corner, and there, halfway down the street, they saw the hand organ man standing under a tree. Oh, maybe the monkey is up the tree, cried Bunny. Yes, and my monkey, he up the tree, said the Italian in his funny way. He no come a down. Jacko, Jacko, he called. Come a down, please. But though the hand organ man held up his arms and begged his monkey to come down, the little furry creature would not come. He sat perched on a high limb, looking with his bright eyes at Bunny, Sue, and the man. Several boys and girls, as well as some men, came over to see what was going on. "'I'll climb the tree and get him,' offered George Watson. "'Better not. Monkeys can bite and scratch,' said Mr. Gordon, who kept the grocery store. "'What happened to him, Bunny?' Bunny told him how Wango had frightened the organ monkey. "'Maybe if you play, Mr. Italian Man, he'll come down,' exclaimed Sue after a bit. "'Ha! That's a good idea,' said Mr. Reinberg, who sold dry goods in Belmere. "'Go get your hand organ, Mr. Italian.' "'Sure. Me make a de nice any music,' agreed the man. "'Maybe Jack will come a-down den.' Off he ran to get his organ, which he had left on the grass in front of Miss Winkler's house. But even when the organ was played, the monkey up in the tree would not come down. He chattered and climbed farther up. "'Oh, I know what let's do,' suddenly cried Bunny Brown. "'What?' asked his sister Sue. "'Let's give him our lollipops. That is, what we have left of em. Wango likes lollipops, you know, and this monkey ought to like em just as well. I'll give him mine,' and Bunny looked at his half-eaten candy." "'And he can have mine, too,' exclaimed Sue. "'Better let the hand-organ man give him the candy,' said Mr. Gordon. "'The monkey will know him better. "'I guess it's a good idea, though, offering him the lollipops.' "'Much a thank of you,' said the Italian, smiling, "'as he took the pieces of candy on the sticks, which the children gave him. "'He held them up to Jacko and said something in Italian. "'The monkey chattered just as if he were talking back.' and then he began slowly climbing down the tree. "'Oh, Bunny, he's coming, he's coming!' cried Sue. "'He much a like a de candy,' said the Italian organ grinder, who was now smiling. "'Come on, Jacko, come on!' The runaway monkey did not seem so much afraid now, or perhaps he was very hungry for the candy. Anyhow, down he came, until he could jump to his master's shoulder. Then he put one little hairy paw around the Italian's neck, and with the other held the lollipops, which he at once began to eat. "'Say, that's the time you and Sue did it, Bunny,' cried Mr. Gordon. "'It was a good trick, but the monkey will eat all your candy.' "'Oh, I don't mind,' Bunny said. But he did care just a little, and so did Sue. However, the Italian was so glad to get his monkey back that he gave Bunny and Sue each a penny so they could buy new lollipops.' Then the organ man fastened the string on the monkey's collar again, and started off up the street. "'Let's follow him,' said Sue to Bunny. "'Maybe the monkey will run away again, and we can help get him out of a tree.' "'No, we'd better go home,' Bunny said. "'Mother may be looking for us.' So home they went, and just in time, for Mrs. Brown was about to ask Uncle Tad to look for the children." Every day for the next week Bunny Brown and his sister Sue would ask when they could start for Grandpa's farm, and their mother would say, Pretty soon now. Daddy hasn't his surprise quite ready. Oh, why can't you tell us, begged Sue? Because then it wouldn't be any surprise, said Mrs. Brown with a laugh. Bunny and Sue had some good times while they were waiting, but they were anxious to have fun on the farm, and one morning soon after breakfast, they went out in the yard to play and saw a strange sight. Into the drive rumbled a big automobile, almost like a large moving van. Bunny and Sue ran out of the way. The big automobile came to a stop. The man on the front seat jumped down, and going around to the back opened the doors. Bunny and Sue peeped inside the van. "'Oh, look, look, Bunny!' cried Sue. "'It's just like a playhouse inside.' It's got beds and a table and even a stove. Oh, what is this all for? 
My, what a big, queer auto, said Bunny. And it's even got windows in it. Why, we could camp out in it. Is it ours? he asked the man. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. A Queer Slide. Bunny Brown and his sister Sue stood looking at the queer big automobile. They had seen some like it once before, passing through the town loaded with tables, chairs, a piano and other things when someone was moving but this automobile was different inside as the children could see were four small beds bunks they were called as bunny knew for that was what a bed was called in a ship or a big boat and a bunk was like a shelf sticking out from the side of the wall besides the bunks inside the big automobile van there were chairs a table and a cupboard in which, through the glass doors, could be seen dishes. "'Oh, Bunny!' cried Sue. "'We're going to eat! We're going to eat! I see the dishes! We're going to eat in this auto!' "'Yes, and we must be going to cook, too,' said Bunny. "'I see an oil stove and some pots and pans. "'That is, we are going to eat if this is our auto,' he went on, looking again at the man who had steered it into the yard of the brown house. "'Is it ours?' Bunny asked." "'Well, your father told me to bring it up here and leave it, "'so I guess it must be yours or his.' "'And the man smiled at Bunny and Sue. "'Oh, goody!' cried the little girl, "'dancing up and down for joy. "'It's our auto! It's our auto!' "'Fine!' exclaimed Bunny, with eyes that sparkled, "'almost as brightly as did Aunt Lou's diamond ring, "'which was found in the lobster claw. "'And are we going to have a long ride in it?' Bunny asked. "'Well, as to that, I don't know,' answered the man. "'Your father told me to bring the auto up here and leave it. "'He'll be home pretty soon, I guess, and tell you all about it. "'I'll be going now.' "'The man had put the brakes on so the wheels could not turn, "'and thus let the automobile run away. "'Now he waved his hand in good-bye to the children and walked off. "'Bunny and Sue raced into the house. "'Oh, mother!' cried Sue. "'Oh, mother!' cried Bunny.' Then both together they fairly shouted, "'Come on out and look at the big auto!' Mrs. Brown smiled and went out with the children. She did not seem as much surprised as they had been. "'What's it for, Mother?' asked Bunny. The man said, "'Papa sent it up. Are we going to take a long ride in it?' "'Well, I think so, Bunny.' "'But if we go riding in this, how can we go to Grandpa's farm?' Sue wanted to know." "'You had better wait until your father comes home, and he'll tell you all about it,' her mother replied. "'May we go inside and look at it?' asked Bunny. "'Yes, come along,' and Mrs. Brown led the way up the little pair of steps that were fastened at the back of the big automobile. Once inside, Bunny and Sue thought they had never seen such a fine place. It was just like a little house of two rooms, one room being shut off from the other by heavy curtains. The first room they went into was where they would eat and cook, and, when the table was cleared off, they could sit around it and read or play games. There was a hanging lamp over the table. There were two windows in this room with nice white curtains draped over them, and along the sides of the room were cupboards and little places where dishes, pans, and other things could be put away. There was even a clock on the wall to tell the time. In the next room, as Bunny and Sue could see through the curtains, which were pulled back, were four beds, two little ones, Bunny's and Sue's, and two larger beds, or bunks, for Mr. and Mrs. Brown. In this room were also two boxes, or chests. "'That is where we shall keep our clothes when we are traveling,' said Mother Brown. There was a lamp in this room, and windows, with pretty flowered silk curtains over them." "'Then we are really going to travel in this auto?' asked Bunny eagerly. "'Yes,' answered his mother with a smile. "'But I thought we were going to Grandpa's,' remarked Sue. She did not know what it all meant. "'Well, I think this is Papa's secret,' went on her mother. "'And you will have to wait until he comes home, when he can tell you all about it.' Bunny and Sue shook their heads. 
They did not know what it all meant, but they thought the automobile was fine, and they could hardly wait for the time to come when they should travel and live in it. "'It's just like a sleeping car on the railroad train,' said Sue. "'It's better,' Bunny cried. "'You can eat in it, too. Once I ate on a train, but my milk all spilled in my lap when I tried to drink out of my glass. Bunny and Sue had once traveled all night on the railroad and had slept in a bed on the car and had also eaten in the dining coach, so they knew something about it. For some time the two children looked about inside the queer big automobile that was made into a little house, and then they climbed down the steps again. "'And it's real, too. It isn't make-believe,' said Bunny, as if that were the best part of it. "'Shall we have real things to eat?' asked Sue. "'Oh, I think so,' her mother told the little girl. "'I—I I feel hungry now,' observed Bunny with a sigh. "'Well, run to the house and get some cookies,' his mother said. "'Then you and Sue may go off and play for a while. "'But don't go too far. It will make the time pass more quickly. "'And when you come back, Daddy will be here, "'and will tell you all about the big automobile.' "'Come on, Sue,' cried Bunny. "'We'll have some fun.' Soon the children, a cookie in each hand, were racing about the yard, playing with Splash, the big dog. Splash liked cookies, too, and I think he had almost as much of Bunny's and Sue's as did the children themselves. Mrs. Brown had gone into the house, and Bunny and Sue were left in the yard. They soon grew tired of playing with Splash, and, as the dog himself was rather hot, he went to lie down in the shade. "'I know what let's do,' said Bunny, after a bit. "'What?' asked Sue, who was always ready to go where her brother led. "'What can we do, Bunny, to have some fun?' "'We'll go over to the pond and catch frogs,' answered Bunny. "'I'll get my net, and you can take a tin can to keep em in.' "'But we won't hurt the frogs, will we, Bunny?' "'No, we'll just catch em and let em go again, to watch em hop. Come on.' Bunny had made himself a little net out of a bean pole with a bent wire in the shape of a hoop and some mosquito netting pinned over it. Not far away from the brown house was a pond where there were many frogs and tadpoles, which are little frogs before they have any legs. The pond was in a hollow place where the clay had been dug out to make bricks, for near Belmere was a large brick factory. The water rained into the pond and stayed there for some time, as it could not run out or soak down through the clay. Bunny and Sue were allowed to go to the clay pond because it was not deep and not far away, but Mrs. Brown always told them to be careful not to slip down in the wet and sticky clay or muddy water. So now, with the net and the tin can to catch frogs, away the two children started. They had not been frog hunting since Aunt Lou went back to New York. There ought to be lots of frogs now, said Bunny. Yes, agreed Sue. I hear them singing every night. Frogs don't sing, her brother said. Yes, they do, too. No, they don't. Then what do they do, Sue wanted to know. They croak, said Bunny. Frogs can't sing, they just croak. Well, they can hop, then. Sue was sure of that. "'cause the ones George Watson let loose at our party hopped. "'Oh, yes, frogs can hop. "'Bunny knew that well enough. "'All septon pollywoggles,' went on Sue. "'They just wiggle. "'That's right,' said her brother. "'Pollywogs can't hop, "'cause they've got no legs. "'Come on.' "'The two children were soon at the frog pond. "'They could hear the frogs croaking or singing, "'whichever you call it and with his net Bunny was soon scooping around in the water to catch some of the hopping, swimming creatures. "'Oh, I've got a big one!' the little boy suddenly cried, as he lifted the net into the air. "'Where's your can, Sue?' "'Here it is, Bunny.' Sue held up an old tomato can with the cover off, while her brother turned his net upside down over it. Some black mud and water splashed from Bunny's net, some splattering on Sue's dress. She looked eagerly into the can. "'There isn't any frog at all, Bunny,' she exclaimed, much disappointed. "'No frog!' shouted Bunny. "'Of course there is.' With a stick he poked in the mud on the bottom of the can. No frog was there. "'Well, he must have hopped out,' he said. 
Maybe you didn't have one, Bunny. Yes, I did, but he got away. He was a big one, too, but I'll get another. A little later, Bunny did catch two frogs, though they were small ones. He put them in Sue's can. She looked at them for a while and then asked, Oh, Bunny, oughtn't I to put some water in the can so the frogs can swim? They won't like us if we don't let them swim. Well, put a little water in, said Bunny. With the frogs in the can, Sue dipped it into the pond at the water's edge. Then she gave a sorrowful cry. Oh, Bunny, the frogs hopped out. They got away. Oh, dear, the little boy said. What made you let them go? I didn't. They wented themselves. They swimmed right out. Oh, well, never mind. I can get more. Bunny was real nice and cheerful about it, wasn't he? Some boys would have made a fuss if their sister let their frogs go, but Bunny Brown was different. Soon he caught four more frogs, and this time he helped Sue put water in the can, scooping it up with his hands, so the frogs did not get out. But catching frogs gets tiresome after a while, and after a bit, Bunny and Sue were ready to stop. They looked about for something else to do. Not far from the pond was a high bank of clay, partly dug away. It was like a little hill, and sloped down to the edge of the pond. "'Oh, Sue, I know what let's do,' cried Bunny. "'What? Let's go up to the top of the clay hill and roll stones down into the water.' "'All right, let's.' Sue set down her can of frogs, and Bunny laid aside his net. The clay hill was too slippery to climb, so the children went around to the side, on a part where the grass grew. Soon Bunny and Sue stood at the top of the hill. It was not very high nor very steep, and at the top were a number of stones. We'll roll em down and watch em splash in the water, said Bunny. Down the slippery clay slide the children rolled the stones, watching them splash into the little pond at the bottom of the hill. All of a sudden, as Sue rolled one stone, larger than any of the others she had yet played with, she gave a cry. Oh, Bunny, Bunny, I'm slipping, I'm falling, she called. Bunny gave a jump toward Sue, hoping he could catch her, but he too slipped on the smooth clay at the top of the hill, and the next second Bunny and Sue went sliding down, right down the clay hill toward the shallow pond at the bottom they slid, like Jack and Jill, who went up the hill after a pail of water and then tumbled down. End of chapter 4、Chapter、Five of Bunny Brown and His Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. Off to Grandpa's Farm. Bunny, Bunny cried Sue as she slid along. Oh, Bunny, I can't stop. I, I can't either, answered her brother. But don't be afraid, you won't get hurt, Sue. No, but Bunny, if I go into the water, I'll get all, all wet. Well, I'll get wet too, and then Mamma will know it was an accident. Say, we're sliding fast, Sue, aren't we? Bunny Brown and his sister Sue were certainly sliding fast. The clay hill was wet with rain that had come down in the night, and the clay was as slippery as glass. The little boy and girl dug their heels in, or they tried to, but the clay was hard as well as slippery. Down and down they went, faster and faster. Sue tried to dig her fingers into the clay, but she could not, any more than Bunny. Neither of them could stick the heels of their shoes in. On and on they slid, faster and faster. Oh, dear, cried Sue, I wish our dog Splash were here. He couldn't stop us, replied Bunny. He'd slide too, same as we're sliding. Well, well, anyhow, said Sue, almost ready to cry. He, he could pull me out when I fell in the water, and, and I'm going to fall in, Bunny. I know I am. I'm going to fall in. Oh, dear. Never mind, Sue. I'll fall in with you, and I'll pull you out. It isn't deep. No, but it's awf awful muddy, Bunny. Bunny did not have time to answer. He only had time to yell, Look out, Sue, here we go in! And splash in went Bunny Brown and his sister Sue. Right in the shallow pond of muddy water they slid, sitting down. 
It did not hurt them, for the clay was soft and smooth where the water covered it. But, though the two children were not hurt, oh, so dirty and muddy as they were. They had made such a hard splash into the puddle that the water was sprinkled all over them like a shower from a fountain. For a moment after sliding in and coming to a stop, Bunny and Sue looked at one another, not saying a word. "'Well,' said Bunny, after a bit, with a long breath, "'you didn't get hurt, did you, Sue?' "'No, not hurt, Bunny, but—but but look at my—my my dress!' Sue's lips quivered and her eyes filled with tears. "'Don't care,' said Bunny kindly. "'I'm all mud, too. Le "'Let's go home,' Sue went on. "'I must get a clean dress, and I don't want any more frogs, Bunny.' "'I guess I don't either. We'll let em go.' Bunny tried to get up from where he was sitting in the puddle of muddy water and clay, but it was so slippery that almost as soon as he stood on his feet he went down again. "'Oh, oh!' cried Sue. "'You're splashing me more, Bunny.' "'I—I I couldn't help it,' he said. He looked at Sue and laughed. "'What are you laughing at?' she asked. "'At you. You do look so funny.' There's a lump of clay right on the end of your nose. Oh, is there? Sue reached for her pocket handkerchief to wipe off the mud, for she did not like a dirty face. But she found that her pocket was under water, and of course her handkerchief was wet through. Lend me yours, Bunny, she begged. And Bunny, who had his handkerchief in his waist pocket, up above the wetness, wiped the clay from his sister's nose. Then, by being careful, he managed to stand up. He helped Sue to her feet, and the children waded to shore. The water was not more than a few inches deep, but it was very muddy. Bunny and Sue emptied the frogs out of the can. The little green fellow seemed glad to hop back into the pond again. Then the two children started for home. "'Oh, my goodness me! What has happened to you?' cried their mother when she saw them coming through the gate. We, we fell in, said Sue. No, we slid in, Bunny said. Oh, dear, well, however it happened, you are perfect sights, gasped Mrs. Brown. I never saw such children. Bunny and Sue told how it had happened, their sudden slide down the clay hill, and, as they had not meant to get in the mud puddle, Mrs. Brown did not scold very much. It was an accident. "'But you must be more careful next time,' she said. "'We will,' promised Bunny. "'He was always ready to promise. "'Anyhow,' said Sue, "'if we're going to Grandpa's, "'we can't go to play near the frog pond any more. "'That's so,' agreed Bunny. "'Or even if we go for a ride in the big automobile, "'we won't get muddy any more, Mother.' "'Mrs. Brown and the cook took the muddy clothes off the children.' and then Bunny and Sue each had a fine bath in the clean white tub. Soon they were as nice and neat as ever. "'Now don't go away from the house,' said their mother. "'Stay in the yard and play. It will soon be time for your father to come home to supper, and then—' "'Then he'll tell us about the big automobile,' cried Bunny. "'And about the secret,' said Sue. Sue played with her dolls— while Bunny spun a musical top his Aunt Lou had sent him from New York, and, almost before they knew it, the children heard someone at the front gate ask, "'Well, how do you like it?' "'Oh, Daddy!' they cried, and they raced down the walk to meet their father. "'What's it for? Is it for us? Are we to live in it? When are we going to Grandpa's farm? Can we take the auto with us?' Bunny and Sue asked so many questions of their father, and they asked them so fast that he could not answer them. He could only laugh. Then, catching Sue up in one arm and Bunny in the other, Mr. Brown carried them into the house. "'Well, mother,' he asked his wife, "'how do you like it?' "'I think it's fine,' said Mrs. Brown. "'And do you think you could live in it and sleep in it for three or four days on a trip to Grandpa's farm?' "'Why, yes, I think it would be very nice.' "'Oh, Daddy, are we going to Grandpa's in the big auto?' asked Bunny. "'Yes, I think we shall.' "'And is that the secret?' Sue asked. "'It is,' her father answered. "'I'll tell you all about it. "'The automobile is an old moving van. "'I bought it from a man, and I thought it would be nice if it could be fixed up 
like a gypsy wagon, so we could travel in it and eat and sleep in it. I had it made into a sort of little house, you see, with beds, a table, chairs, and an oil stove. I thought we could take a little vacation in it this summer. Then, after Grandpa sent us the invitation to spend the summer at his farm, I thought how nice it would be if we could go there in our big auto instead of in the train. Would you like that? he asked Bunny and Sue. Oh, of course, Bunny replied. Sue clapped her hands and nodded her head. She liked it, too. Well, then, that's what we'll do, Mr. Brown went on. We will make the trip to Grandpa's in the big auto. We'll live in it just as the gypsies live in their wagons, that are drawn by horses, and we can camp out if we want to. But we won't take anybody's horses and not bring em back, the way the gypsies did to Grandpa, said Bunny, will we? Oh, no, of course not, echoed Sue. Well, then, if it's all settled, we'll have supper and talk more about our trip afterwards, said Mr. Brown. That night, when the table was cleared, the little family gathered about it, talked about what fun they would have. Can I steer, Bunny wanted to know? Oh, no, I'm going to let Bunker Blue do that, his father said. Bunker was a big, strong young man with red hair who helped Mr. Brown in the boat business. Bunny and Sue could hardly sleep that night thinking of the fun they were going to have in the big automobile and on Grandpa's farm. The next morning they helped their mother get ready to start. Bed clothes were put on the four bunks, the oil lamps and the stove were filled, and things to eat were put in the cupboard. On the way they could stop at stores along the road and buy more things when they were hungry. Very soon all was in readiness. Two days later, the house having been locked up for the summer, Bunny Brown and his sister Sue, with their father and their mother, took their places in the little house that was made inside the big automobile. Bunker Blue was out on the front seat to steer and make the automobile go. "'Are you all ready?' asked Bunker of Mr. Brown. All ready, Bunker, you may start now. Chug, chug, went the automobile, and away it rolled, out of the yard and into the street. Hurrah, cried Bunny Brown, we're off for Grandpa's farm. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Bunny Brown and his sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge Just Like Gypsies Away down the road rumbled the big automobile, which was just like a little house on wheels. Bunny Brown and his sister Sue sat, one at each window, on cute little chairs and looked out. Oh, isn't this fun, cried Sue. The best fun we ever had, agreed Bunny. It was more fun than when we were shipwrecked on the island, remember? Yes, when we played Robinson Crusoe, went on Sue, and we couldn't find Mr. Friday because it was Thursday, and she laughed. And you fell in, added Bunny, and Splash pulled me out. Oh, father, suddenly cried Bunny, as Sue mentioned the name of the pet dog. Couldn't we take Splash with us? Well, I don't know, said Mr. Brown slowly. You know we weren't going to take him down on the farm, because Grandpa has a dog. But I guess, if you want Splash very much, we have room for him. What do you say, Mother? And he looked at Mrs. Brown. Oh, let the children have their pets, said Mother Brown. Fine, shouted Bunny. We'll stop at Mr. West's and get him, said Mr. Brown. When the Brown family decided to go away, they had not planned to take Splash with them and he was left at the home of Sadie West, a little girl with whom Sue played. Sadie said she would take good care of Splash, but now Bunny and Sue wanted him with them. So the big automobile was steered down toward the West home, and a little later Splash was barking joyously inside the little room and trying to kiss with his red tongue Bunny, Sue, and Mr. and Mrs. Brown all at the same time. Oh, I'm so glad we're going to take you, cried Sue, hugging her pet. Half of Splash belonged to Sue and half to Bunny. They made believe to divide the dog down the middle lengthwise, so each would have a part of the tail, 
which always wagged so joyfully when Splash saw either of the children. Once again the automobile, a little house on wheels, set off. "'Good-bye,' called Sadie West to Sue, waving her hand. "'Good-bye,' echoed Bunny and his sister. Down the main street of the village they went, many of Mr. Brown's friends stopping to wave their hands or hats to him. Such an automobile fitted up inside so a family could live in it was seldom seen in Bellmere. "'There's Charlie Star," called Bunny, as he saw a boy on the street. "'Yes, and there's Helen Newton,' added Sue. "'Oh, I wish they were going with us.' "'We haven't room, my dear,' said her mother, for sometimes Sue would invite her friends to stay to dinner or to supper without knowing whether her mother thought it best. "'Besides,' went on Mrs. Brown, you will find many playmates and enough to do on Grandpa's farm. Yes, I guess we will, said Bunny. I'm going fishing. And I'm going to pick flowers, Sue said. I don't like fishing, because the worms on your hook are so squiggly. Mr. and Mrs. Brown sat in easy chairs in the little dining room of the automobile. It was also the sitting room when the table was not set and it was the kitchen when the cooking was being done on the oil stove, so you see it was three rooms in one. Beyond the dividing curtains was the bedroom with the four bunks against the wall. There were windows in that room, but the Brown family seemed to like best sitting in the one nearest the back doors of the automobile. It's just like being in a railroad train, said Bunny, as he looked out of the window and waved to Harry Bentley, one of his friends whom he saw just then on the steps in front of Harry's house. Yes, said Sue, it's like a train, except in it jiggles you more, for the street was a bit rough and the car bumped unevenly along and swayed from side to side. It will run more smoothly when we get out on the soft, dirt country road, Mr. Brown said. A little later they had passed out of the village. On the front seat Bunker Blue steered the machine and made it go faster or slower, just as he needed to. Inside, Splash walked about, feeling a little strange at first, perhaps, but he saw Bunny and Sue and Mr. and Mrs. Brown, so of course he knew it was all right, and that he was one of the family. "'Mother, I'm hungry,' said Sue. "'Could I have something to eat?' "'Maybe a jam tart,' added Bunny, the kind Aunt Lou used to make with the jam squashing up through the three little holes on top. "'Yes, I have made some of them,' Mrs. Brown said. "'I'll give you some. You must be hungry, as we had an early breakfast.' Mrs. Brown knew how to make jam tarts, just like those Aunt Lou used to bake. A little cupboard was opened, and a plate of the nice tarts set on the table for the children. "'Oh,' murmured Sue. "'Ah,' said Bunny. "'And would you like a glass of cool milk?' asked Mrs. Brown. "'But how can we have cool milk on a hot day when we have no ice?' asked Bunny. "'Oh, but we have ice,' said Mrs. Brown, laughing. "'See, Daddy had a little ice box put in, "'and I keep the butter, milk, and other things that need to be cool in there.' "'And surely enough, in one corner of the dining, sitting room, and kitchen "'was a little ice box, out of which Mrs. Brown took a bottle of milk.' So Bunny and Sue were having a nice little lunch, which tasted all the better because they were eating it as they rumbled along in the automobile house on wheels. Splash looked on hungrily until Mr. Brown tossed him a dog biscuit. Sadie West had bought some for him, thinking she was going to keep the dog, but she had put the biscuits in the automobile when Bunny and Sue came for their pet. Mile after mile along the road rumbled the big automobile van, like a circus wagon. Bunny and Sue sometimes sat near the back doors, looking out, or else they climbed up on boxes near the side windows. Mr. and Mrs. Brown sat and talked and laughed at the funny things the children said. Out on the front seat, Bunker Blue held the steering wheel. "'Could I ride outside with him?' asked Bunny after a while. I want to ride outside, Daddy. No, indeed, little man, answered his father. You might get bounced off and hurt. This auto isn't like Mr. Reinberg's, in which you once had a ride. It would not be safe for you or Sue to ride outside. 
"'But I want to talk to Bunker,' persisted the little boy. "'Well, I think I can manage that,' Mr. Brown went on. "'There is a window in the front part of the auto, right close to the back of Bunker's seat. "'I'll open that window, and you can talk to him through it. "'Go into the bedroom.' Bunny and Sue walked into the front part of the automobile, through the hanging curtains, and surely enough, when Mr. Brown opened a window he had cut in the front of the van, there was Bunker's smiling face looking in. He saw Bunny and Sue and laughed. "'Oh, Bunker, isn't this lovely?' asked Sue. "'Well, it's better than rowing a boat full of fish, anyhow, Sue.' "'And we had something to eat,' went on Bunny. "'Are you hungry, Bunker?' "'Well, no, not real hungry. I had some chewing gum a while ago.' "'I can give you a sandwich, Bunker, if you'd like it,' said Mrs. Brown, looking out of the window over the heads of Bunny and Sue. "'Chewing gum isn't good to eat.' "'Oh, I didn't swallow it,' said the red-haired young man. "'But I'm not hungry. I'll wait until dinner. I couldn't eat and steer this big auto at the same time. I'll wait.' "'It will soon be time for dinner,' said Mrs. Brown.' On went the car, and at noon it came to a stop in the road near a shady bit of woods. "'Here's where we'll eat,' said Mrs. Brown. "'Shall we set the table inside or out on the grass?' "'Out on the grass,' cried Bunny. "'Then we'll be just like gypsies at a picnic.' So Mr. Brown lifted the table out of the automobile, and he and Bunny and Sue helped put on the dishes and the knives and forks. Mrs. Brown cooked the dinner on the oil stove. There were meat and potatoes and green peas, besides tomato soup, which Bunny liked very much. There was milk for the children and tea for the older folk, and they sat on chairs under the trees and ate what Bunny said was the best dinner he had ever had. Sue liked it, too, and so did Bunker Blue. Then, after a little rest, they went on again. Oh, I forgot to say that, of course, Splash had his dinner also. He ate the scraps of meat and the bread and potatoes left over when all the others had finished. He liked his dinner very much. On rumbled the big automobile over the country roads. Many persons who passed it, some in other cars and some in carriages, turned to look at the funny house on wheels. Perhaps they wished they had one like it. "'And are we going to sleep in it tonight?' asked Sue, when the sun began to go down. "'Yes,' answered her mother. "'I'll make up your little beds, just as I do at home. "'But I can't sleep if it jiggles and squiggles so much, mother.' "'We'll not travel at night,' said Mr. Brown. "'We'll find a nice place beside the road, "'run the auto under the trees, and stay there until morning. "'Then the auto won't jiggle you, Sue.' "'All right, Daddy, that's nice.' Just before dusk they stopped for supper. This was just as much enjoyed as was the dinner. Mrs. Brown made lemonade when Bunker found a spring of cold water. Just as supper was over and they were sitting about the table, which was out on the ground near the back of the automobile, Mrs. Brown pointed to some smoke that was to be seen coming up through the trees not far away. "'That looks like someone camping over there,' she said to her husband." "'Maybe it is. There are several bands of gypsies around here,' he said. "'It may be some of them.' Bunny Brown and his sister Sue looked at one another. They were both thinking of the same thing. Could these be the gypsies who had taken Grandpa's horses? The smoke rose higher and higher through the trees, as Mr. and Mrs. Brown, with the help of Bunker, began to wash the supper dishes." Bunny and Sue walked a little distance away from the car toward the smoke. "'Don't go too far,' their mother called to them. "'We won't,' answered Bunny. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Bunny Brown and his sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge The Woodland Camp The two children walked slowly down the road, at the sight of which, under some big willow trees, the automobile was drawn up for the night, which would soon come. Mrs. Brown was busy making up the beds. 
one for bunker blue was to be made on the ground right under the automobile itself an extra cot had been brought along for him but it was folded up in the automobile mr brown was busy looking over the machinery of the engine or motor that made the automobile go he wanted to be sure it had not broken so they would be able to go on again in the morning and finally get to grandpa's farm where are you going bunker called bunny as he and sue saw the big red-haired boy start down the road with a pail on his arm i'm going for water bunker replied why we have some in the ice-box cried sue for she had had a glass a little while before you can drink that water bunker oh i don't want to drink sue it's the automobile that wants one bunker answered how funny laughed sue automobiles can't drink oh yes they can replied bunker i have to pour water in ours so the engine won't get too hot it doesn't exactly drink it but it needs it to cool itself off that's why i'm going for water now i'll come with you offered bunny and of course where bunny went sue went too so the brother and sister were soon walking with bunker down to the spring there he filled the pail with water and coming back with it he poured it into what is called the radiator of the automobile the place where the water itself is kept cool so it will cool the hot engine there exclaimed bunker when he had finished now the auto has had a good drink and it can go to sleep if it wants to oh do autos go to sleep sue wanted to know well they stay nice and quiet all night her father told her at least i hope ours will and it is almost the same as going to sleep now mother have we everything ready for the night i think so said mrs brown bunker if you'll get out your cot i'll make it for you and then you can slide it under the automobile oh thank you mrs brown replied the big boy but i can make my own bunk i'm used to it mrs brown looked through the ice-box and in the cupboard she wanted to see if she had everything she needed for breakfast and as soon as she opened the ice-box she exclaimed there the milk we won't have any for the children there's only a little bit left where can we get any mr brown came back from having looked at the engine which he found was all right milk he said why there's a farmhouse a little way over on that road and he pointed to it i guess we could get milk over there then we'll have to do it bunker no you're making up your bed aren't you you can't go you and i will go for the milk she said to her husband and take bunny and sue with us no i think not they seem to be having a good time and they'll be all right here with bunker until we come back there might be cross dogs at the farmhouse and it may be too far for them to walk you stay here bunny and sue she went on while daddy and i go for some fresh milk don't go far away now no ma'am promised bunny again he and sue saw many things to look at near the place where the automobile had stopped for the night there were some flowers and ferns growing in the grass and sue made a nice bouquet then bunny found a place where he could break off long willow branches from a tree and he had fun playing he was the ringmaster in a circus cracking the willow whip and making the make-believe horses jump over pretend elephants sue looked up from her flower gathering and said to her brother oh bunny look what a lot of smoke she pointed to where the smoke had been seen before curling up through the trees of the woods it is a lot of smoke said bunny maybe the trees are on fire let's go and look bunny did not stop to think that if the woods were on fire it was not a very good place for him and his sister to go but the trouble was with bunny brown that he did what he wanted to do first and thought about it afterward if i had my fire engine here i could put out the fire said bunny but his fire engine was only a toy and though it did squirt water when he turned the handle it only sprayed out a little about a tin cup full so i guess it could not have put out a very big fire we'll go to see what it is decided sue she was always willing to go where bunny led her bunny looked back toward the automobile bunker blue was not to be seen 
He was under the big van, fixing up his cot for the night, that would soon be turning everything dark. Down a side road, Bunny could see his father and mother going to the farmhouse for the milk. "'We'll just walk a little way and look at the fire,' said Bunny. "'Mother or father won't care about that, and maybe we'll have to tell them there is a fire so they can telephone for the engines.' "'There aren't any telephones here in the woods,' said Sue. "'Well, then they can holler for the engines,' Bunny remarked. He did not care much about that part. He wanted to see the fire. "'Come on,' he called to his sister. And so the two tots started toward the place where they could see the smoke curling up over the trees. If Bunker Blue had seen the children, he would have called to them to come back, so would their father and mother." But Mr. and Mrs. Brown were hurrying toward the farmhouse, and Bunker was under the automobile, and just then he had struck his head on a piece of wood, and his head hurt so that Bunker had to rub it, and tears came into his eyes, though he did not exactly cry. But the tears did not let him see very good. That is why he did not see the children set out toward the fire. So Bunny and Sue walked on toward the woods. The woods were darker than the road, and reaching the edge of the trees, Sue hung back. "'I don't want to go in,' she whispered. "'I's afraid.' "'Oh, don't be afraid,' answered Bunny. "'I won't let anything hurt you. Where's Splash? He won't let anyone hurt you, either.' But the big dog was, just then, racing over the fields, after a bird he thought he could catch. So no one saw Bunny Brown and his sister Sue as they went into the woods. They could see the smoke of the fire much more plainly now. And then, all of a sudden, they came to a place in the woods where there was a camp. There were white tents, and a number of wagons, with looking-glass on the sides, were standing near some horses which were eating grass. And, in and about the tents and wagons in the woodland camp, were a number of dark-colored men, women, and children. They looked like Indians but Sue knew who they were as soon as she saw the gay wagons. "'Oh, Bunny,' Sue whispered, "'they're gypsies. Maybe they have Grandpa's horses. This is a gypsy camp, Bunny.'" End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of Bunny Brown and his sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge A Night Scare Perhaps if Sue had not spoken of Grandpa's lost horses, Bunny might not have wanted to keep on toward the gypsy camp. But when his sister spoke, the little boy seemed to become brave all at once. "'That's so, Sue,' he whispered to her, as he took hold of her hand so she would not be frightened. Maybe Grandpa's horses are here. These folks are gypsies, sure enough. Just like the pictures in the books, added Sue, also whispering. She and Bunny could see where several gypsy women and children were standing about the fire, over which were pots from which steam came. The gypsies were cooking their supper. The men gypsies stood near the horses and wagons talking. Some of the men were smoking and they all seemed to be having an easy time. "'Shall we go up and ask them if they have Grandpa's horses?' Bunny inquired of Sue. "'Yes,' she said. "'But you won't let the gypsies take me, will you?' "'Nope,' said Bunny. He and Sue had often heard their little playmates talk about gypsies taking children away, but I do not believe this ever happens. The gypsies have children of their own children who like to live and travel in the queer wagons, and why should the gypsies take other children who might be a trouble to them and cry to come home? Still, Bunny and Sue thought the gypsies might take them away in one of the wagons, with the shining looking-glasses on the sides, or that they might be kept in one of the tents, but the two children wanted to find out about Grandpa's horses, so they kept on. By this time, some of the gypsy women had seen the two tots. One woman, who wore a bright handkerchief on her head, came up to Bunny and Sue and asked, "'Where are you going? Where do you live? Aren't you lost?' "'No, ma'am,' said Bunny, while Sue sort of slid around behind him, 
We're not lost. Our automobile is over there. And Bunny pointed to the road. We just came to see if you had our grandpa's horses. The gypsy woman seemed surprised and called to one of the men who came up smoking a pipe. We are gypsies too, said Sue bravely. Perhaps she thought if she said that she would not be taken away. Or maybe she thought it would be the best way of finding the lost horses. You are gypsies, exclaimed the woman, smiling. Bunny thought it was queer she could speak just as he did. But most gypsies in this country can talk our talk. We're going to Grandpa's in a big automobile, said Bunny, to explain what Sue meant. And it's got beds in and a table and a stove, just like your wagons. And he waved his hand toward the queer carts in which the gypsies traveled from camp to camp. You are funny little gypsies, laughed the woman. But what is this about Grandpa's horses? Maybe their grandfather has horses to sell or trade, suggested the gypsy man. Where does he live, little chap? Oh, a good way off, answered Bunny, hardly at all afraid now. But he hasn't any horses, because he let some gypsies take his horses to pull their wagons, and they didn't bring them back. So my grandpa has no horses, but I thought maybe you had them. Some other gypsies who had gathered around to hear what was being said laughed at this. Then the man spoke. We have some horses, he said, but they are not your grandfather's little chap. But I think you had better run home, or run back to wherever your automobile is. Your mother may be looking for you. Bunny and Sue had not thought of that. I, I guess we had better go home, said Sue. Yes, agreed Bunny. If Grandpa's horses aren't here, we had better go back. Do you know the way? asked the gypsy woman. If you are afraid, I will go with you, if you tell me where your automobile is. I, I guess we can find it, thank you, said Bunny. He was not sure that he could, for it was almost dark now, and the gypsy fire looked bright and cheerful. But Bunny did not want to walk along through the woods with the gypsy woman. She might, after all, take him and his sister. Come on, Sue, said Bunny to the little girl and they turned back on the path by which they had come. Goodbye, called the gypsy woman after them. Come again and see us, and I will tell your fortunes. All right, answered Bunny, waving his hand. What's a fortune, asked Sue, when they had walked on a little way. It means what's going to happen to you. Well, lots happened to us, Bunny. I slid down the clay bank hill, and so did you and once I sat in a hen's nest and broke the eggs. That isn't a fortune, said Bunny. That's just bad luck. But let's run, Sue. It's getting awful dark, and maybe we can't find the automobile. Let's run. Bunny set off, fairly dragging Sue after him, but she called out, Oh, Bunny, I can't run. My legs is too tired. Let's go back and get the gypsy woman to take us. No, said Bunny, I can find our auto all right. He kept on. He went more slowly, though, so Sue would not get tired. At first, Bunny managed to keep to the path through the woods, the path that led from the main road on which their automobile was standing. But in a little while, Bunny found himself walking into a patch of bushes. Oh, oh, cried Sue as the bushes scratched her face. Where are you going, Bunny? Bunny did not answer, for he did not know himself. He was off the path. Oh, dear, cried Sue. Let's go back to the gypsy camp, Bunny. No, I'll find the way, he said. I'll find our automobile. Just then there was a rustling in the bushes and in the dried leaves under them, and Sue, somewhat frightened, exclaimed, Oh, Bunny, what was that? Once again Bunny did not answer for a moment for he did not know what the noise was. But he did not have to speak, for a second later there came a loud bark. Oh, it's a dog, cried Sue. Maybe it's one of the gypsy dogs come after us. A dog did rush up to Bunny and Sue, but it was a good friendly dog and seemed very glad to see them. It jumped about Bunny, and no sooner had the little boy put his hands on the shaggy back of the frisking animal then Bunny cried out, Why, it's Splash! It's our dog, Splash! 
oh how glad i am laughed sue now we're all right oh you dear old splash she put her arms about the neck of splash and he seemed as glad to meet bunny and sue as they were to see him then a voice called from the darkness bunny sue where are you oh it's daddy bunny cried oh you children another voice said it's mother shouted bunny here we are he added we went to the gypsy camp to look for grandpa's horses but we're coming back now we didn't find the horses but splash found us the next minute mr and mrs brown were beside bunny and sue while splash frisked about and barked as though he had done it all oh bunny and sue said mrs brown you shouldn't have gone away you should have stayed with bunker he was quite frightened about you and so were we but you're not scared now are you mother asked bunny because we're not lost any more but i'm tired and sleepy said sue i want to go to bed yes i guess bed is the best place for all of us said mr brown now bunny sue you must not go away like this again you might have been lost in the woods all night the gypsies would have brought us home observed bunny one gypsy lady wanted to but i thought i could get home myself and i almost did he added tell me about the gypsies said mrs brown as she looked off through the woods where a faint glow of the campfire could be seen bunny and sue told of their little adventure they were sorry they did not find grandpa's horses for him i guess the gypsies who have them are far away from here remarked mr brown a light was seen flickering through the trees along the path and a voice called where are you it's bunker blue said mother brown i told him to come after us with a lantern soon bunker came up did you find him he asked eagerly yes mr brown answered they're all right and a little later they were all safely at the big automobile bunny and sue had some bread with the milk their father and mother had bought at the farmhouse then they were undressed and tucked in the little bunks bunker went to sleep in his cot under the van and splash curled up on the grass near him and after seeing that everything was snug for the night mr and mrs brown went to bed also their first day's travel was over every one had been sleeping soundly for some time and bunny was dreaming that he had found grandpa's horses and was riding down a slippery hill on one of them when all of a sudden in the middle of the night there came a loud yell let me alone get away from here that's bunker blue bunny heard his father say bunny sat up hardly awake sue also sat up in her bunk then splash began barking under the automobile where bunker was sleeping only bunker was not sleeping now for he was wide awake and he called out again quit i say oh mr brown mr brown somebody's trying to upset the auto oh mamma wailed sue bunny did not know what to do wait a minute i'm coming called mr brown as he jumped out of bed end of chapter eight chapter nine of bunny brown and his sister sue on grandpa's farm by laura lee hope this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by nan dodge the lost horse what is it cried bunny brown what's the matter is it gypsy after bunker blue asked his sister sue mrs brown pulled aside the light curtains that hung in front of the children's bunks don't be frightened she said it isn't anything perhaps bunker is dreaming and talking in his sleep daddy will make it all right is splash barking in his sleep sue wanted to know mother brown laughed and bunny and sue felt better after that once more bunker blue called out hey quit will you stop it ouch i'm being tickled oh bunny brown and his sister sue laughed again they could not help it for it seemed so funny bunker blue being tickled in his sleep by this time mr brown had lighted a lantern slipped on a bathrobe put some slippers on his feet and was going down the back outside steps of the van 
These steps, you remember, folded up out of the way when the automobile was traveling. What is it, Bunker? What's the matter? Bunny and Sue heard their father ask. Why, why, I don't know what it is, answered the red-haired lad who steered the automobile. But it's some big animal after me. He poked his head right into my cot, and he struck me with something sharp. Maybe he tried to bite me. Mr. Brown flashed his lantern under the automobile where Bunker was sleeping. Only, of course, as I told you, Bunker was not asleep now. Nor was Splash, for the dog was running around and barking. "'Why, this is funny,' said Mr. Brown. "'I don't see anything, Bunker. "'Are you sure you didn't dream it all?' "'Dream it? No, sir, I felt it.' Just then there came a loud moo, moo, moo. Bunny Brown and his sister Sue knew right away what that was. "'A cow!' they both cried. "'It's only a cow!' Their father, outside, looking under the automobile where Bunker Blue had his cot, heard them. "'Yes, it is a cow,' he said, and his lantern flashed on a big brown cow. There she stood a little way back from the automobile, looking at Mr. Brown and Splash, and blinking her eyes at the lantern. She could not see Bunker under the automobile. "'Yes, it was the cow that scared you, Bunker,' said Mr. Brown. "'She must have been tied to a stake in some pasture, but she pulled herself loose and came over to see you.' "'Well, I didn't want to see her,' exclaimed Bunker, poking his head out from beneath the van. "'She can just go right back where she came from. "'And I guess she wanted to get some of the long, sweet grass that grows under your cot,' went on Mr. Brown. "'That's why she came. And that was what had happened. "'The cow had pulled up the stake to which she was fastened, "'and had wandered from her pasture down the road to where Bunker was asleep under the automobile.' The cow had not meant to wake him up, but as she reached for the grass, her horns must have poked Bunker as he slept on his cot. That was what made him cry out. Mr. Brown took hold of the cow's rope and led her far enough off to keep her from bothering Bunker again that night. Then Mr. Brown tied the rope to a fence and came back to tell Bunny, Sue, and their mother all about it. "'Well, I'm glad it wasn't Gypsy,' said Sue, as she curled up in her bunk again to go to sleep. Pooh cried Bunny. "'Gypsies don't have horns like cows.' They were soon quiet again, though Splash did growl once in a while, as he heard the cow moving about a little way off. But at last even Splash went to sleep, and so did Bunker. Nothing more bothered them, and it was broad daylight and the sun was shining, when Bunny Brown and the others opened their eyes again. "'Breakfast! Breakfast!' cried Mother Brown. "'Bunny! Sue! Wash for breakfast!' There was a wash basin and stand in one corner of the automobile bedroom, and though it was quite different from the big bathroom at home, Bunny and Sue washed their faces and hands very nicely and thought what fun it was. While they were doing this, Mother Brown was cooking the breakfast on the oil stove and Daddy Brown and Bunker Blue were setting the table out under the trees. Splash was not doing anything except looking hungry. "'Where's the cow?' asked Bunny as he came down the automobile steps. "'Did she give us any milk for our breakfast?' Sue wanted to know. "'No,' answered her father. "'The farmer who owned her came to get her a little while ago. "'He said she often strayed away from her field in the night.' He might have given us some milk if he had had a pail, but we have plenty in our ice box. Now then, breakfast. And what a fine breakfast it was, eaten at the table out of doors under the willow tree. There were oranges, oatmeal, and big glasses of cool milk with soft-boiled eggs. Daddy and Mother Brown bought the eggs at the farmhouse the night before when they went for the milk. Splash, too, had his breakfast, and then he went roaming off over the fields, perhaps looking for another dog with which to have a game of tag, or whatever game it is that dogs play. "'Are you going to see the gypsies this morning?' asked Bunny. He seemed very much interested in the strange folk who went about the country, living in their gay wagons. "'No, I think we'll travel on to Grandpa's farm,' his father answered. "'We won't go to see the gypsies.' They aren't the ones who took Grandpa's horses. 
A little later the automobile started, Bunker Blue sitting on the front seat to steer. Mr. Brown sat with him to tell him the right road to take, so they would not be lost. Mrs. Brown, with Bunny and Sue, sat inside the automobile near the windows, which were open to let in the breeze, as the day was quite hot. It was lovely traveling this way. They did not go as fast as they might, for Mr. Brown wanted Bunker to go carefully. Then, too, there was no hurry. It was such fun traveling in this new way that Bunny and Sue would not have minded if they could have kept it up all summer. They stopped that noon near a little brook to eat their dinner. It was not far from a small town, and Bunker walked in and came back with some ice cream. After dinner they went on again, and as it looked as though it might rain that night, Mr. Brown said they would stop near the next village, so, in case the storm was a bad one, they could go to a hotel to sleep. "'But the rain won't come in the auto,' said Bunny. "'No, but it might wet Bunker if he sleeps outside under it,' his mother said. "'Let Bunker sleep in the dining room,' suggested Bunny. "'Well, we can do that if it rains too hard for him to sleep out of doors,' Mrs. Brown agreed with a laugh. The automobile was stopped in a grove of trees not far from the town, and when Mrs. Brown was getting supper, Bunny and Sue, with their dog Splash, walked down the road. "'Don't go too far,' their mother called after them. "'It might rain any time.' "'We'll be back soon,' answered the little boy. He and Sue walked on, not thinking they were going far. The clouds did not seem so dark now, and the children thought that perhaps, after all, it might not rain. All at once Sue, who had gone on a little ahead of Bunny, called out, "'Oh, look, a horse! It's a horse, Bunny, and nobody's with him. Maybe it's one of Grandpa's.' "'Maybe it is,' Bunny agreed. "'It's lost, anyhow. I'll catch him, and we'll keep him. We'll take him to our auto and fetch him to Grandpa. He'll be real glad.' Bunny was not afraid of horses especially one as kind and gentle as this one looked to be. Bunny had often fed grass to the grocer's horse when it stopped in front of their house, and once the grocer's boy had held Bunny on the back of the horse and had given him a ride. So now, as Bunny walked up to this horse, which was coming slowly along the road, the little fellow was not in the least afraid. "'Whoa, horsey!' he called, and the horse stood still. "'Oh, I know it's Grandpa's horse,' cried Sue, clapping her hands. "'Grandpa's horses always stand still when you say, "'Whoa!' And that's what this one did. "'Oh, Bunny, aren't you glad?' End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Bunny Brown and his sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge At Grandpa's Farm Bunny Brown walked right up to the horse. Around the animal's neck was a long rope that dangled to the ground. Bunny took hold of this rope and called, Get up, come on! That was what he had heard the grocery boy call to his horse, and it was what Bunny said to his dog Splash when he wanted Splash to run with the express wagon, to which he was sometimes harnessed. Splash, who had run on ahead of Bunny and Sue, now came trotting back. He did not seem surprised to see Bunny with a horse. To Splash, everything Bunny did was all right. The dog barked at the horse once or twice, but that was only his way of speaking, I suppose, and the horse lowered his head and put his nose close to the dog. Oh, now they're friends, cried Sue, clapping her hands, but don't let him bite you, Bunny. Let who bite me? that horse. Horses don't bite, said Bunny. They just eat hay and grass and oats. Anyhow, his head's too high up. He can't reach me to bite me. Bunny now started back down the road towards the automobile, leading the horse by the rope. Sue followed, but she did not like to go so near the horse as her brother went. Sue was just a little bit afraid. Isn't it good we found one of Grandpa's horses? Sue cried. I wish I could find the other one, Bunny. Maybe you will tomorrow. We'll take this one to the auto, and then we can look for the second one. How do you suppose he came to be on the road? I don't know, Bunny answered. 
Maybe he got away from the gypsies. Oh, I hope Grandpa's other horse gets away, Sue cried. And I hope I find it. But I'll let you lead it for me, Bunny, because it might step on me. I'll lead it. I'm not afraid, said the little boy. This horse did not seem to mind in the least being led along by Bunny. It walked slowly, and Splash followed behind. Perhaps the dog thought he, too, was helping drive the horse along, and for all I know he may have been. Dogs drive sheep, and I should think they could drive horses, too, shouldn't you? Pretty soon Bunny and Sue, with the horse they had found, came within sight of the big automobile, around a turn of the road. They saw their mother and father looking down the highway. "'We thought you had run away again,' called Mrs. Brown. "'Oh, no,' answered Bunny, as if he and Sue never did such a thing as that. And really they never, at any time, exactly intended to run away. It was always an accident. "'Well, come along to supper,' Mr. Brown said. "'We're glad you're home.' Then Mrs. Brown happened to notice the horse that Bunny was leading. "'Oh, my goodness me!' she cried. "'That horse! Is it chasing you, Bunny? Sue?' "'No, ma'am,' answered Bunny, quite proudly. "'I'm leading it. We found it. It's a lost horse. It's one of Grandpa's. We'll take it home to him.' For a moment Mr. Brown did not speak. Mrs. Brown did not know what to say, either. She just stood there, looking at Bunny and Sue. Then Mr. Brown began to laugh. "'Well, what will you youngsters do next?' he cried. "'Why, well, you're as bad as the gypsies taking horses that don't belong to you.' "'But we found this one, Daddy,' said Bunny. "'He was all alone on the road, and when I told him to woe, woe'd. he woed. "'Just like Grandpa's horses,' explained Sue. "'So I took him,' went on Bunny. "'He's one of Grandpa's horses, and tomorrow Sue and I are going to find the other one.' Mr. Brown laughed harder than ever. "'Oh, do take that horse away from Bunny,' begged Mrs. Brown. "'He may run away or bite the children or do something. Take him away.' "'Why, he's an awful nice horse,' Bunny said. "'He didn't step on us or run away or do anything. "'And Splash likes him, and so do I and Sue. "'We're going to take him to Grandpa.' "'Bunny is lucky,' said Sue. "'He found Aunt Lou's diamond ring, "'and now he has found one of Grandpa's horses, haven't you, Bunny?' "'Yep, but I guess the horse is hungry, Daddy. "'Shall I tie him to the automobile where he can get some grass?' "'No, indeed,' cried Mr. Brown.' If we tie the horse to our auto, he may run off with it. I'll just tie him to the fence, as I did the cow, and when the man who owns him comes along, he can take him away. Take him away, cried Bunny. Why, it's Grandpa's horse. Oh, no, son, said Mr. Brown kindly. I don't like to make you feel bad, but this isn't Grandpa's horse. It belongs to someone around here, and it probably strayed away, just as the cow did last night. "'Someone will be along after it soon, so I'll tie it to the fence.' "'Oh, dear,' sighed Sue, as her father fastened the horse. "'I thought it was Grandpa's, and he'd be so glad. Didn't you, Bunny?' "'Yes, but never mind. Maybe we can find another horse tomorrow that will be Grandpa's. Anyhow, I'm hungry now.' It did not take much to make Bunny think of something new. "'I'm hungry, too,' said Sue. We'll look for another horse tomorrow. The one they had found straying down the road was now eating grass near the fence. He did not seem to mind where he was. Splash lay down near him, as though to watch, so he would not stray off again. Shall we eat outside? asked Mr. Brown of his wife, or do you think it will rain? I think not. We'll have an early supper, and unless it rains too hard, we won't go to the village hotel. We'll stay here. And let Bunker put his cot in the dining room, added Mr. Brown, if it's too wet under the auto. Oh, I don't mind the rain, said Bunker, who was washing the potatoes for supper. The little table was set out under a tree, and there supper was eaten. It was almost over when a man came along the road. Good evening, he called, and he looked surprised to see the big automobile and the little supper party. Good evening. Have you folks seen a stray horse? One of mine ran away. Then he saw the one Bunny had found, which Mr. Brown had tied to the fence. Why, there's my horse now, the man cried. How'd it get here? I found it, said Bunny. 
I thought it was my grandpa's, but it isn't, Daddy says. Is it yours? Why, yes, little man, it is, and I'm glad you found him. He might have gone off a good way if you hadn't stopped him. Then Bunny told how he had led the horse along the road, and Mr. Brown explained why it was he and his family were traveling in the big automobile to Grandpa's farm. "'If you'll send over to my place,' promised the farmer as he led his horse away, "'I'll give you some peaches and pears.' "'Thank you,' answered Mr. Brown. "'We'll be glad to get them.' And, after supper, Bunker Blue went over, coming back with a nice basket of fruit. "'So it's a good thing, Bunny, that you found the horse after all,' said his mother, "'even if it wasn't Grandpa's. "'Bunny thought so, too.' as he looked at the nice peaches and pears which the farmer had sent over. It did rain that night, but not very hard, and Bunker, instead of coming into the automobile to sleep, hung some canvas curtains around his cot under the car and slept there. He said he liked to be out in the rain, and he had often been on one of Mr. Brown's boats all night out on the bay in a storm. It was bright and clear in the morning, and after a good breakfast they started off again. Bunny and Sue, looking from the windows of the automobile, hoped to see some other horses, which might really be Grandpa's missing ones, but they were disappointed. Nothing much happened for the rest of the trip, which lasted another day. If Mr. Brown had wished to hurry, he could have gone to Grandpa's in two days, but he took his time. On the afternoon of the third day, Bunker Blue steered the big machine down a little hill. At the foot was a big white house with a red barn back of it. "'There's Grandpa's,' called Mr. Brown. "'Yes, and there is Grandpa himself standing at the gate to meet us,' Mrs. Brown said. "'Wave your hands to him, Bunny and Sue.' The children did from the windows of the automobile. Then Bunker steered it up the driveway. Bunny and Sue jumped out. Hello, Grandpa, cried Bunny. Hello, Grandma, laughed Sue. And a second later they were being hugged by the dear old couple, while Mr. and Mrs. Brown got out of the automobile more slowly. Oh, Grandpa, did you find your horses the gypsies took? Bunny asked. No, answered Grandpa Brown. I guess I'll never see em again. And it was my best team, too. And he shook his head sadly. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Bunny Brown and his Sister Sue on Grandpa's Farm by Laura Lee Hope. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Nan Dodge. In the Garden Bunny Brown and his Sister Sue walked up the path to the house with Grandpa Brown. Sue had hold of one of Grandpa's hands and Bunny the other. Behind them came Father and Mother with Grandma Brown. "'Are you glad to see us?' Grandpa asked Sue. "'Glad to see you? Why, I should say I am,' cried Grandpa. "'I thought you would never get here. And what a fine big auto you came in.' "'It's a moving van,' Bunny explained. "'You put pianos and chairs and tables in it, and you take them to the new house when you move. Only we didn't move our things. We moved just ourselves.' "'We had lots of fun,' cried Sue. It certainly is a nice way to travel, said Grandpa Brown, better than with a horse and wagon, or even the steam cars. Yes, agreed Bunny. We're awful sorry about your horses, Grandpa. We saw some gypsies, and we asked them if they had your team, but they said they hadn't. No, I guess the gypsies that took my horses to use for a little while, but forgetting to bring them back, are far enough away from here now, said Grandpa Brown. I'd like to get my team back, though. They cost a lot of money. We almost had a horse, didn't we, Sue? asked Bunny, as he told of the one they had found walking along the road. Yes, we almost had a horse, and we did have a cow, Bunny. Grandpa Brown laughed when they told him how the cow had put her head under the automobile, where Bunker Blue was sleeping and had tickled him in the ribs. Well, well, laughed Grandpa Brown. That was funny. But now you're here, and I guess you're hungry, aren't you? Mother, these children are hungry, cried Grandpa Brown to his wife, though Bunny and Sue had not said so. But probably Grandpa Brown knew that boys and girls are almost always hungry. 
"'Well, come right in,' was Grandma Brown's invitation, "'and I'll get you all something to eat.' Bunker Blue had run the automobile up to the big red barn. The doors were open, and in the automobile went on the barn floor. The barn was large enough to take in a load of hay, and the automobile was not quite so high as that. Soon Bunny and Sue, with their father and mother, were seated at the table, eating a little lunch, and Mr. and Mrs. Brown talked about the trip, and Grandpa Brown told more about his lost horses. "'You see, it was this way,' said Grandpa Brown. "'The gypsies were camped not far from here. "'They had been around here some time, "'and they had done no harm, as far as I could see. "'Then one day a gypsy man came over "'and wanted to buy the horses from me. "'But I needed my teams, "'and so I wouldn't sell him any horses. "'Then he wanted to borrow my two horses "'to pull some of their wagons, "'for they were going to a new camp. He said two of his horses had died. I wanted to help the gypsies, for some of them are good, so I let the man take my best team of horses. He said he would bring them back the next day, but he never did. I hunted all over, and I had the police look, too, but we never could find the gypsies or my horses. It's too bad, and once more Grandpa Brown shook his head. I found Aunt Lou's diamond ring, said Bunny, and maybe I'll find your horses, Grandpa. Well, I wish you would, little man, but I'm afraid you can't. They're gone. Haven't you any horses left? asked Sue. Because if you haven't, I'll give you all the money in my bank, and you can buy some new ones. Bless her little heart, cried Grandma, giving Sue a hug. Oh, I have some horses left, Grandpa Brown said, and I'll take you out to the barn and show them to you, but my best ones are with the gypsies. "'Well, maybe we'll find them, said Bunny. But even Sue, who nearly always thought what Bunny said was just right, shook her little head. The two children, when they had finished the meal, started out of doors. "'Where are you going?' asked Mother Brown. "'Out to the barn to see the horses,' Bunny answered. "'Better get on your old clothes,' their mother advised. "'You and Sue might want to slide down the hay and sit in a hen's nest again.' and old clothes are best for that. Yes, I guess so, laughed Sue, as she thought of what had once happened to her. A little later, wearing their play clothes, which would not be harmed even if they rolled in the dirt, Bunny and Sue set out for the barn to see what they could find. Bunny knew his way about Grandpa's farm, for he was older than Sue, and he remembered having been there once before. Oh, here's a horse, Sue, he cried as he went into the barn. Looking over the edge of the manger, or box where his hay and oats were put, was a brown horse. He sniffed at the children and whinnied, as if glad to see them. When a horse whinnies, it is just as if he laughs. Hello, said Bunny, and, liking horses and not being afraid, he went up and patted this one on the nose. Come on, Sue, rub him. No, Bunny, I'm afraid. Oh, he won't hurt you. Well, I... I can't reach. I'll get you a box to stand on, Sue. Bunny looked around and found a box. He was putting it in front of the stall of the brown horse, stooping over to get it just right when he felt someone pulling on his coat. Don't do that, Sue, cried Bunny. I'm not doing anything, she answered. Yes, you are, too. You're pulling my coat, and I can't fix the box. Oh, Bunny Brown, I am not and Sue stood right in front of her brother so he could see that she was not touching him. And, just then, Bunny's coat was pulled again. Certainly this time it was not Sue. Why, why, what is it? asked Bunny. Oh, Bunny, it's a goat. A goat is pulling on your coat, Sue cried. A goat? Yes, look, he has hold of you now. Bunny turned around quickly as he felt his coat being pulled again. "'Oh, that's a sheep, not a goat!' he cried, and indeed it was an old sheep, or rather a ram, with queer curling horns, and the ram had reached over a low door of the stall next to the brown horse and was pulling Bunny's coat. "'I thought it was a goat,' said Sue. "'And I thought you were pulling my coat,' laughed Bunny, so we're even. "'Hello, sheep,' he called. "'What do you want?' "'Baa!' bleated the ram. "'Maybe he's hungry,' said Sue. 
"'Then we'll go and pull some grass for him, "'and we'll pull some for the horse, too,' cried Bunny. "'Out into the field, back of the barn, "'went Bunny Brown and his sister Sue. "'They pulled up big handfuls of the sweet green grass. "'At least it was sweet to horses, sheep, and cows, "'though it would not taste sweet to you boys and girls. "'Then back into the barn went the children, "'and the horse and ram seemed very glad to get the grass.' Three times Bunny and Sue ran out and got more grass, and every time Bunny would feed the horse any grass, the ram would reach over and pull on his coat. "'I guess the sheep wants you to love him instead of the horse,' he said Sue. "'I'll pat the sheep, Bunny. I'm not afraid of him.' So Sue rubbed the ram's black nose. He seemed glad to see her and put out his red tongue to lick her hands. "'Oh, it feels so funny,' laughed Sue. It tickles me and feels almost as squiggly as when you pick up a worm. Come on out and play, Bunny. They went out in the garden, and there they saw one of Grandpa Brown's hired men stooping down between rows of onions. Are you picking them? asked Bunny. Are you picking the onions? No, little man, I'm pulling up the weeds. I'll help you, offered Bunny, and stooping over, he began to pull up some tall, round, green stalks. "'Don't! Oh, don't do that!' cried the man. "'Why?' asked Bunny. And Sue, who had started to do as her brother was doing, looked up, wondering what was wrong. "'Why, you're pulling up the onions,' said the man. "'We want them to grow.' "'Oh,' said Bunny. He looked, but he could not tell which were the weeds and which the onions. "'Is this a weed?' asked Sue, and she pulled up something green. "'It smells like a weed. Oh, I don't like the smell.' and she made a funny face as she brought her hands near her nose. "'That's an onion,' the hired man said. "'I guess you had better run in from the garden and let me do the weeding. When you get older you can tell which are weeds and which are onions.' "'I'm never going to eat onions anyhow,' Sue said, making another funny face with her nose all wrinkled. "'I don't like onions either,' Bunny said. "'They have an awful funny smell, haven't they, mister?' "'Well, some folks think so.' and the hired man went on with his weeding while the children ran away. But they did not go to the house. Instead, they walked farther on through the garden until they came to some rows of boxes. "'Oh, look at the cute playhouses!' cried Sue. "'Let's look at them, Bunny.' "'All right,' answered her brother. They went up to one of the houses. A queer sort of buzzing sound came from it. "'Let's look inside,' said Bunny. "'All right,' agreed Sue. "'There's a lot of flies in front, Bunny,' and she pointed to them. As Bunny was about to lift off the top of one of the boxes, he heard the hired man from the onion patch calling, "'Get away! Run away from there, or you'll be stung! Run! Run!' End of chapter 11